The Book of Revelation. When was Revelation written? Picture a time of great turmoil and distress, particularly for Christians. This was during the first century AD, a period characterized by Roman rule, where emperors of the time were notorious for their brutal persecution of Christians. These were dark times for those who followed Christ, marked by fear, suffering, and relentless oppression. Before the book of Revelation was written, the Roman Empire, which was vast and powerful, viewed Christianity as a threat to its pagan religious traditions and societal order. People often unfairly blamed Christians for different bad things that happened in the empire, which led to their persecution. It was in this context of suffering and persecution that the book of Revelation was written. The author, traditionally identified as John, found himself exiled to the small rocky island of Patmos, located in the Aegean Sea. This exile is described in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, where John states, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom, and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Patmos was a lonely and empty island where the Roman rulers sent people they wanted to keep quiet or punish. John, who wrote the book of Revelation, was sent there. In this lonely and tough place, John had special visions that he wrote down in the book of Revelation. These visions were like symbolic depictions and important messages that gave hope and strength to Christians who were being treated badly. Symbolic Messaging The book of Revelation is a great example of a special type of writing in the Bible known for using lots of symbols and images to talk about the end of the world and how good will finally win over evil. One of the most interesting and talked about parts is in Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 through 18. This section describes two scary creatures, one coming up from the sea and the other from the land. In these verses, John describes the first beast as coming out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, with a blasphemous name on each head. This beast represents a form of anti-God power and authority. John writes, the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. The dragon here is often interpreted as Satan, and the beast as a corrupt and oppressive system or ruler opposing God's will. Then, John speaks of another beast that comes out of the earth. This second beast works on behalf of the first beast, making the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. It performs great signs and deceives the people, even causing a mark to be placed on people's right hands or foreheads. This mark, famously known as the mark of the beast, is stated to be the number 666. Revelation chapter 13 verses 16 through 18. The message of Revelation 13, with its beasts and symbols, reflects the struggles of early Christians under oppressive regimes. It can be seen as a coded message, using symbolic language to represent the Roman Empire and its emperors, who were persecuting Christians at the time. The imagery of beasts and dragons symbolizes the ultimate battle between good and evil with the faithful being encouraged to remain steadfast and hopeful, despite the persecution and trials they face. Thus, Revelation, especially in passages like Revelation 13, serves not only as a prophecy about the future, but also as an encouragement to its original audience. 
It reassured them that despite the overwhelming and terrifying power of their oppressors, God's victory was assured. The use of symbols in these messages made it possible to share them even when people were watching closely. This gave hope and strength to a community that was facing a lot of troubles. The number seven. In the book of Revelation, the number seven repeatedly emerges, carrying with it a profound significance. This number is often seen as symbolizing completeness or perfection, which is deeply rooted in the biblical narrative. Let's start with the seven churches. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, John is instructed to write to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These churches were real, each representing not only a specific community, but also reflecting the diverse challenges and spiritual states faced by the broader Christian community. The number seven here could symbolize the complete or universal nature of the message, reaching out to every corner of the church. Moving to the seven seals in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, John sees a scroll in God's right hand, sealed with seven seals. These seals, when broken, unveil significant events and judgments. This imagery of seven seals can be seen as a representation of God's complete and perfect plan for judgment and redemption. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 2, seven trumpets signal different disasters and big events on earth. These trumpets, similar to the seals mentioned earlier, show a series of steps that God takes as we get closer to the end of the world. The number seven here might mean that it covers everything in God's plan, including all the different judgments that will happen in the end times. In all these parts of Revelation, the seven churches, seven seals, and seven trumpets, the number seven is really important. It's like a special sign that shows everything is complete, whole, and perfect in what God plans and does. The number seven is found a lot in the Bible. It's there right from the start with the seven days it took God to create the world. And it pops up many more times in both the first part, Old Testament, and the second part, New Testament of the Bible. Thus, the recurring theme of the number seven in Revelation is not just a random choice. It's deeply symbolic, speaking to the totality and perfection of God's plans and purposes, and serves as a reminder that every event unfolds according to His divine will and timing. The Four Horsemen The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse described in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, are among the most dramatic and symbolic figures in the Bible. Each horseman represents a different aspect of the calamities that will occur before the end times. The White Horse The white horse represents defeat and victory. This image comes from the vision described in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, where it says, I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. In simple terms, the white horse is a symbol of someone who comes to conquer or win. The rider on the horse is often seen as a powerful figure, who could either be good or bad. Some people think this rider might represent Jesus as a victorious figure, while others think it could be the Antichrist, symbolizing false peace or deceptive victory. The key ideas are the themes of defeat and the ability to overcome challenges or enemies. The Red Horse The Red Horse represents war and violence. The Bible 
specifically in Revelation chapter 6, verse 4, says about this horse and its rider. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. This passage suggests that the red horse symbolizes a time when peace is taken away from the world, leading to conflicts and wars. The large sword the rider carries further emphasizes the idea of warfare and destruction. In simple terms, the red horse is a symbol of the violence and bloodshed that can occur in times of war. The Black Horse the black horse represents famine and economic hardship. This is described in Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. This passage suggests that the black horse and its rider symbolize a time when food will be scarce and very expensive. The scales in the rider's hand are used for measuring food portions, indicating that food is so scarce that it has to be carefully rationed. The mention of wheat and barley being sold for a day's wages shows how costly basic food items will become, making it hard for people to afford what they need. The instruction not to damage the oil and wine might imply that while basic necessities are scarce, luxury items are still available highlighting the inequality during this time of hardship. The Pale Horse The pale horse in the book of Revelation represents death. This is explained in Revelation chapter 6, verse 8, which says, I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. This pale horse and its rider death symbolize the coming of death in a widespread manner. The verse suggests that this horseman has the power to bring death to a large portion of the earth through various means like war, famine, and disease. The fact that Hades, the place of the dead, follows close behind implies that many will die as this horseman passes through. This image is part of a larger vision in Revelation that uses dramatic and symbolic imagery to describe future events and the end times. These horsemen in the broader context of Revelation are part of the opening of the seven seals by Jesus Christ, marking the beginning of the end times. They represent the challenges, trials, and tribulations that the world will face before the final judgment. The colorful and dramatic images share important spiritual lessons and motivate people who believe in God to stay strong, even when things are tough. When the four horsemen show up in the story, it's a strong message that the power of things in the world is only temporary and that in the end, God is the one who has true control and power. Six, six, 6. The Number of the Beast The number of the beast has been a subject of fascination and debate for centuries. Let's dive into what this number represents and its significance, especially focusing on Revelation chapter 13 verse 18, which states, This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. In simple terms, the number of the beast is often interpreted as a symbol of imperfection and evil.
in contrast to the number seven, which frequently represents completeness or perfection in biblical texts. The number 666, therefore, is seen as a sharp contrast to divine perfection. It's the epitome of what is unholy and wrong. Here are some insights into its meaning and representation. Political and Social Context The beast, symbolized by 666, could represent oppressive governments or leaders, especially those that demanded loyalty or worship in ways that contradicted Christian belief. End Times and Antichrist The number is often linked to the Antichrist, a figure that is said to appear before the end times, embodying evil and opposition to God. Universal Symbol of Evil Over time, 666 has become a universal symbol for evil, used in various cultures and contexts beyond its biblical origins. Avoidance and Fear There's a phenomenon called Hexacosio hexaconta hexaphobia, the fear of the number 666. It's led to people avoiding the number in various ways, such as skipping floor numbers in buildings. Numerological Interpretations Some have looked at 666 through the lens of numerology, where numbers are believed to hold spiritual significance. In this view, 666 might represent an imbalance or a distortion of spiritual principles. In conclusion, the number of the beast is a complex and layered symbol in the book of Revelation. Its interpretation varies, but it's generally seen as a representation of evil, imperfection, and opposition to divine will, deeply rooted in the historical and political context of the time when Revelation was written. New Heaven and New Earth The concept of a new heaven and a new earth, as described in the Bible, particularly in Revelation chapter 21 verse 1, is a fascinating and deeply meaningful aspect of Christian eschatology, the part of theology concerned with the final events of history or the ultimate destiny of humanity. In simple terms, it's about what we believe will happen at the end of the world as we know it. The key verse, Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. This imagery of a new heaven and new earth is symbolic of a complete renewal and transformation of all that exists. But what does this really mean? Let's break it down. The idea of a new heaven and a new earth isn't just about remodeling what's already there. It's about a total radical transformation. It's like the difference between patching up an old house and building a brand new one from scratch. In this new creation, all the pain, suffering, and tears that mark our current existence will be gone. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. This is a promise of a place free from all the things that cause us hurt and sorrow now. Perhaps the most significant aspect of the new heaven and new earth is that God will dwell directly with humanity. The barrier that sin created between humans and God will be completely removed. This closeness with God represents the fulfillment of a long-awaited relationship that we believe was intended from the beginning of creation. The new heaven and new earth also represent a return to the way things were meant to be when the world was first created. It's like hitting the reset button and going back to the perfect harmony and beauty of the Garden of Eden. For Christians around the world, 
The promise of a new heaven and new earth is a symbol of hope. It's a future assurance that all the struggles and challenges they face in the present world are temporary and that something much better is waiting for them. This new creation is also where believers will experience eternal life. It's a life that's not just about living forever, but living forever in a state of joy, peace, and fulfillment with God. Overall, the new heaven and new earth are about the ultimate hope and promise for Christians, a complete renewal of all things, the end of suffering, eternal life, and most importantly, an unbroken close relationship with God. This concept is a cornerstone of our Christian faith, offering a powerful vision of what the future holds for those who believe. Letters to Seven Churches The letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, which you can find in chapters 2 and 3, are really interesting and special. Every letter was written for each church's specific situation. In these letters, John gives a mix of praise, points out things they need to work on, and offers advice. Let's make this simple to understand. Ephesus, the lost love. The letter to Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 7, commends the church for its hard work and perseverance, but criticizes it for losing its first love, meaning its initial devotion and passion for Christ. Jesus tells them to remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. Smyrna, the suffering church. Smyrna, Revelation chapter 2 verses 8 through 11, receives praise for its faithfulness in the face of suffering and poverty. Jesus encourages them by saying, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Pergamum, Compromising Faith The church in Pergamum, Revelation chapter 2 verses 12 through 17, is commended for holding firm to their faith in a city full of evil. However, they are criticized for tolerating false teachings and are urged to repent. Thyatira, Tolerance of False Prophets Thyatira, Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29, is praised for its love and service, but criticized for tolerating a false prophetess. Jesus warns them to hold fast to what they have until he comes. Sardis, the dead church. The church in Sardis, Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, is described as being alive in name, but dead in reality. They are urged to wake up and strengthen what remains. Philadelphia, the faithful church. Philadelphia, Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13, receives no criticism, but is praised for keeping Jesus' word, despite having little strength. They are promised protection and reward for their faithfulness. Laodicea, the lukewarm church. Laodicea, Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, is criticized for being lukewarm, neither hot nor cold in their faith. Jesus rebukes them by saying, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich. Each letter ends with a phrase, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This suggests that these messages have broader implications beyond the immediate context. They represent various challenges and conditions that can exist in any church at any time, such as losing the initial passion for faith, facing persecution, compromising with the world, tolerating false teachings, 
becoming spiritually dead, remaining faithful despite weakness, and becoming complacent or lukewarm in one's faith. These letters provide rare insights into the early Christian church's struggles and triumphs, offering timeless lessons for believers on staying true to their faith in the midst of various trials and temptations. They also highlight the importance of self-examination and continual spiritual growth for individuals and church communities. The Battle of Armageddon The Battle of Armageddon, as described in the Bible, is one of the most dramatic and significant events in the book of Revelation. It's a symbol of the ultimate conflict between the forces of good and evil. Let's delve into this fascinating and often misunderstood topic. Armageddon comes from the Hebrew word Har Megiddo, which means Mount of Megiddo. Megiddo is a real place in Israel, known for its strategic importance in ancient military history. The Bible mentions it in Revelation chapter 16, verse 16. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. While Armageddon is linked to a specific location, its meaning in Revelation goes beyond a mere physical battle. It represents the climactic struggle between God's kingdom and the opposing forces of evil. It's a metaphor for the ultimate showdown between good and evil. In Revelation, the build-up to Armageddon includes various judgments and plagues sent upon the earth, symbolizing the struggle and chaos of the end times. The battle itself is part of the unfolding of God's final judgment and the establishment of His rule. The Bible also talks about the gathering of earthly kings and their armies under the influence of satanic forces, set to oppose God and His people. This is seen as the height of human rebellion against God's authority. The book of Revelation doesn't describe the battle in detail, but it's clear about the outcome. The forces of evil are decisively defeated. This fight highlights how, in the end, God will win over all that is evil. The concept of Armageddon has been used throughout history to reflect the ongoing struggle between tyranny and freedom, oppression and liberation, reflecting the human condition and our understanding of moral and spiritual conflict. For believers, Armageddon is a reminder of God's sovereignty and justice. It's a call to faithfulness and a warning against aligning with forces opposed to God's will. The aftermath of Armageddon in Revelation leads to a new creation where suffering, injustice, and death are no more. It's a vision of hope for a future where God restores and renews all things. In summary, the Battle of Armageddon in the Bible is a complex and multi-layered concept. It's not just about a future battle, but it's deeply symbolic of the eternal struggle, a reflection of human history, and a powerful message of hope for ultimate justice and the restoration of creation. Symbolism of Babylon Babylon is a symbol packed with deep meaning. It's not just a reference to an ancient city, but a representation of all that stands against God and His ways. First, understand that the real Babylon was a powerful city in ancient times, known for its wealth, luxury, and moral corruption. It was famous for the Tower of Babel, the story in the Bible where people tried to build a tower to heaven, showing their pride and desire to be like God. This history sets the stage for Babylon symbolism in Revelation. In Revelation 18, Babylon is described as a great city that falls. Verses like Revelation chapter 18 verse 2 say, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. 
She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit. Babylon here represents the ultimate rebellion against God, a society indulging in luxury, immorality, and idolatry, completely opposed to God's ways. The fall of Babylon in Revelation is a dramatic picture of the defeat of all that defies God. It's a warning and a promise. A warning against aligning with worldly systems that are morally corrupt and opposed to God, and a promise that such systems will ultimately be overthrown. Babylon is also a symbol of economic and political power used for oppression and injustice. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 3, it says, The nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. This portrays how the whole world can be intoxicated or seduced by such corrupt systems, leading them away from truth and righteousness. Furthermore, the fall of Babylon is a call for God's people to separate themselves from such corruption. Revelation chapter 18 verse 4 says, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins. This is an invitation to avoid complicity in a system that is fundamentally opposed to God's values. Finally, the symbolism of Babylon extends to the end times, representing the collective forces of evil that will rise against God but will ultimately be defeated. It's a picture of the final victory of good over evil, of God's kingdom triumphing over the forces of darkness. The book of Revelation shows the strength and faithfulness of the early Christians. The book of Revelation was like a guiding light for them when times were really tough, reminding them that no matter how hard things got, God's big plan for saving and fixing every wrong would come true. This story, which is based on real history and the Bible, teaches us about how important it is to keep believing despite our circumstances, how hope can keep us going when we're in a tough situation, and how a group of believers can stay strong together. Who wrote this book? John the Apostle, also known as Jesus' beloved disciple, had a special role among Jesus' twelve main followers. He started as a simple fisherman and grew to be a key person in the early Christian church. This shows how much someone's life can change because of their faith. John was very close to Jesus, and this special bond gave him a deep understanding and special experiences that shaped what he wrote in Revelation. The book of Revelation starts off by mentioning that it is a message from God given through Jesus Christ. This message was meant to tell God's people about things that were going to happen soon. It says this right at the beginning in Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. This part of the Bible makes it clear that John is the one who received this special message, and it highlights that these visions and messages he got are directly from God. John's connection to the visions is further highlighted in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, where he addresses the seven churches in Asia. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne. Here, John positions himself not just as a messenger, but as an intermediary between the divine realm and the early Christian communities. The book of Revelation becomes deeply personal in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. Here, John identifies himself as a partner in suffering, kingdom, 
and patient endurance. This part of the Bible shows us that John was going through the same hard times as other early Christians. Finally, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 8, John reaffirms his role as both a witness and recorder of these revelations. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. This statement strengthens his trustworthiness and highlights how significant his words are. Going on a journey through 10 rare facts about Revelation is more than just learning about a part of the Bible. It's like diving deep into the thoughts and feelings of one of Jesus' closest friends. While we learn these facts, let's keep in mind the person who wrote them, John the Apostle, and the special bond he had with Jesus, which greatly influenced the Christian faith. Conclusion The Book of Revelation, known for its detailed symbols and clear pictures, teaches us some really important things. It shows us that power and money in this world don't last forever and reminds us not to rely on them too much. By telling the story of Babylon and its downfall, we are warned about how dangerous it is to be morally wrong and how tempting it can be to chase after power that goes against what God wants. Moreover, Revelation teaches us about the importance of staying true to our faith, even in the face of difficulty and persecution. It calls for discernment, urging us to recognize and reject the corrupting influences of the world that are contrary to God's values. Above all, Revelation assures us of God's ultimate victory over evil. It serves as a reminder that no matter how chaotic or challenging the world may seem, God's plan for justice, righteousness, and redemption will prevail. This book, therefore, not only provides a glimpse into the future, but also offers guidance and hope for our lives today, encouraging us to live in a way that aligns with God's eternal kingdom. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today drawing inspiration from the lessons in the book of Revelation. In life's challenges and uncertainties, we seek your guidance and strength. Lord, just as the book of Revelation teaches us about perseverance and faith, we pray for the courage to remain steadfast in our belief in you. Help us to hold on to hope, even when we face trials and tribulations in our lives. Give us the wisdom to discern your will and the resilience to follow your path, even when it's difficult. We ask for your protection, as symbolized by the four horsemen, reminding us of the nature of earthly troubles and the eternal promise of your kingdom. Help us to focus on what is everlasting and true, rather than being distracted by temporary struggles or fears. Grant us the spirit of endurance, as shown by the early Christians, to withstand any persecution or hardships we may encounter. May we be inspired by their unwavering faith and commitment to your word. In moments of doubt or confusion, Remind us of the ultimate victory that you promise, a new heaven and a new earth, where pain and suffering are no more. Let this vision of a future filled with your glory and love strengthen our faith and guide our actions. Father, we ask for your guidance in understanding the complexities and symbols in Revelation. Let these teachings deepen our faith and expand our comprehension of your divine plan. In every aspect of our lives, may we seek to embody the love, grace, and righteousness that you have shown us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Let our lives be a testament to your unending love and mercy. 
We thank you, Lord, for your constant presence in our lives and for the hope and salvation you offer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.